So welcome everyone to this uh, AI ethics uh, seminar. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Jakob Stensake from Lund University, uh, who will talk to us about the computational complexity of ethics. As usual, we'll gather uh, comments or questions in the chat. And after around 45 or 50 minutes, uh, I expect we'll get time for uh, Q&A when we can all discuss around that. Uh, so with that, I hand over to you, Jakob, please go ahead. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And uh, it's great to see people uh, on Zoom that uh, has come here to listen to me. So yes, I'm going to talk about uh, on the computational complexity of ethics, moral tractability for minds and machines. And you will see, I, I hope that you will get an idea what this means uh, further on. But I'll tell you a bit about myself. I'm Jakob, PhD student in moral philosophy, practical philosophy it's called, at uh, Lund University. And I have a broad project called How to Build Nice Robots. And here's some pictures of cool stuff that I've done uh, from, some <laughs> from some papers. I have a supervisor who got this WASP HS money to look into the imperfect creator creating the perfect. So the idea that maybe we can create uh, machines that are better than us in that they're nicer or more moral and that kind of stuff. And this has led to my PhD project. Uh, so I'm trying to uh, respond to this idea that you can create something like a, a perfect uh, thing. Uh, to, I, I will spoil it already that it's it's uh, hard to make something uh, perfect. So I'll just tell you a bit about the interdisciplinary space I'm working in. So I'm working on ethical machines. So then I would use moral philosophy to to sort of tell uh, what one ought to do, what one morally ought to do. And I would use cognitive science of uh, as a way of understanding what humans can do. And then computer science, what computers can do. And this can all, uh, there's some really fruitful synergies and how you can, uh, uh, what they can bring, uh, constrain each other, bring to one another and so forth. I also operate under a very broad idea of what ethics is. So I think that there's this uh, biological layer, you can call it, which you can study in evolutionary game theory that um, it's beneficial for fitness and for a variety of purposes that we cooperate. And this is one part of morality. Another is this more social psychological thing that we have as individuals who live in groups, that we have trust, care, and empathy. And then we also have this very complicated cultural layer of the norms and societies and religions and ideologies that we uh, uh, live on. And I, my hope is to bring all this in to, uh, this is Epi. We have it in the robot lab in uh, Lund. Uh, I don't think I will uh, get this far to implement all the insights. I've, I've mostly been uh, theoretically, theoretically oriented in my research. But maybe I think my, the more greater aim or the more feasible aim is at least that it's not so much how to make a nice robots, it's to better understand what human morality is and how it works. So I will, the field I'm working in is called machine ethics. So this is, uh, I, I like to think of it as evolving three set of questions. One is the feasibility question, whether and to what extent machines can be moral. Then there's the desirability question, whether and to what extent machines should be moral. And then there's all this technical work where, which tries to answer, how do you actually build them? And for the feasibility and desirability, it's a whole uh, inflated debate uh, of, this is just a, a map of showing all the different opinions in whether robots should have rights. So, uh, and these debates typically center around uh, very human concepts such as rationality, consciousness, and autonomy. And I think these have, have a very play a major part in at least in Western uh, the Western history of self understanding. Uh, you can we can think of the Enlightenment ideas of a free autonomous citizen or a Cartesian idea of uh, that plays into our Abrahamitic tradition of that we have a soul, uh, we have a value in, in the eyes of God, this sort of stuff. So this is usually often assumed it's a starting point for ethical discussions of uh, human morality. But of course, there's no 
good consensus or a clean way of uh, defining or pinpointing the importance of these sort of moral capacities um, anywhere uh, you look. And this is just a, a glimpse of all some of the technical work from this great sur survey by Tolmeyer from 2020. Uh, I usually divide all the technical work into three kinds of moral machines. You would have the rule followers, which follow some sort of logic. Uh, you have the causal engines, which follow some sort of probability theory or causal reasoning. And you have the moral learners, which um, uses machine learning basically more broadly. So my hope is to bring these questions closer together, because I think that ought implies can. So whatever we think of desirability of uh, what kind of robots we should have, it should be constrained and informed by the feasibility. And we also need more nuance about this feasibility, because there's a big difference between when something can be made easily with um, technology we have today versus it's a mere theoretical possibility in the far future. Uh, so I think in a lot of these discussions, this, this nuance is not so uh, well articul articulated. I have one previous solution to this problem. Uh, and it's this, how, to, how do you resolve this? Because some of us just want to build stuff and have a good time. And uh, some of us just want to be really critical of stuff and just think and uh, the world is ending. So how do you unite this? And I think that in some ways, these are activities that fundamentally differ. But at least we can maybe learn to talk about it. And I have a, another paper uh, on this. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about a more technical uh, approach to feasibility question. So instead of asking what ca human capacities uh, do machines need to behave ethically, I'm going to ask what kind of ethical problems can a computer solve? Uh, so the idea here that we can investigate the moral competence or skill of AI systems and concretely root it in the de facto feasibility, we can root this in the AI methods of today without talking about this uh, opaque, uh, say, human capacities. This could also give us some formal tools to understand and constrain the space of moral behavior as it is carried out by computational systems. and uh, also. Uh, it might also help us to understand how human morality works and how human uh, morality is constrained by uh, these uh, certain constraints. And a preliminary project I did last year, uh, it's a pretty shit uh, paper, but it just raises the question at least. So I had an idea that, well, you would have this, let's say, self driving. Uh, vehicles like a drone or an ambulance, and they, need, they may need to make critical decisions under short time frames. Uh, so, but the question is that so different ethical strat uh, theories will give you different decision strategies, uh, which cost different sort of uh, gives different resource costs. And then the question is, what sort of ethical theory should we prioritize, or what decision strategy should we, should we prioritize? So I just made a very simple model of three sort of ethical strategies and then you can easily show that some of them are good in the long term uh, some are good in the short term some are good in the long term and the short uh, short term but this is very trivial in if you are aware uh, in philosophy you have these problems with the theory called utilitarianism that i mean should i think of the, the consequences right now or for all eternity and this would also give you this uh, problem it's in, in the algorithmic, uh, and we, when we speak of algorithms, this is very, very known in this uh, explore exploit research in reinforcement learning on this uh, multi arm bandit problem. But it's extremely, extremely, extremely implementation dependent. So it would depend on how you frame the problem itself, the environment, what the environment affords, the al algorithm, and whatever heuristic you used, the computational method. The resources you have available very broadly construed. So I've been thinking. Uh, so I was thinking: uh, is there a very general yet implementation invariant way to explore this? And this led me to more than a year to dig into computational complexity, which is. Uh, I think I like the summary that sometimes the problem is the problem, and I have written a roughly hundred page uh, 
paper on this that is still in still in peer review uh, since a couple of months, but it's on our archive, so you can check it out. And uh, I will tell you uh, some of the uh, stuff I learned uh, doing this. So I don't know how much you know about computational complexity. I will, I will assume that you know nothing, or at least a little bit. Is that a, you think that's reasonable, Ulle? So the complexity of a problem is the amount of resources the fastest known algorithm requires to produce an acceptable output. And this resource usage determines complexity classes. So it can tell us something about how hard a problem is or a set of problems. So the two most common resources for computers are time and space. So time, we, we think of computations, calculations, state transitions, and, and space is the amount of memory you would need. So the motivation is that this can give you a certain implementation invari invariance. So if an, the fastest known algorithm for a certain problem is slow on one computer, it is slow on all computers. So even if the runtime might differ by like a millionth, if you compare a computer from the 60s from one to today, uh, the amount of uh, res uh, resources, the amount of state transitions would uh, stay the same. So I, I usually use this salad example. So, you know, when you, you enter a, cantina, a bamba, and you see this salad buffet. Uh, so, and you have the question, what ingredients do you pick to get the best possible salad? So you might think that, oh, I'll just pick all the things I like. Uh, this is efficient. You just pick all your favorite ingredients, but that makes a very messy salad. You might just think uh, that you could select two best ingredients, uh, but then you, you, you feel like, well, you like sun-dried tomato and pineapple in isolation, but together they're really, really off-putting. So you want a strategy that respects the combinatorial principle of gastronomy, where you would think of the synergy between the different ingredients. And this you can do uh, by searching through all of the possible uh, configurations. Uh, of all the possible salads from the set of ingredients. And this, you, if you have a salad bar with 20 ingredients, this gives you roughly a billion uh, different salads. And this is, can become really stressful if, if there's a line behind you and you, you don't want to spend all your life uh, putting together a salad. So you might think that I don't care that much about salad, but we can think that what if you have faced similar kind of uh, situations in, in ethical environments or where you have this kind of ambulance that need, an ambulance that needs to pick up as many uh, people as possible, uh, and then you might you might run into these uh, intractable problems. A little bit of background: a hundred years ago, Hilbert asked, "Is mathematics decidable?" So this means that is there a mechanistic procedure, what we call algorithm, that can unanimously decide the truth or falsehood of any mathematical statement? And then Church and uh, Turing said no, but everything that can be computed can be computed by a Turing machine. So, and this has then later on, we figure out it's not just the, the, the problems that you can decide, but the ones that you can solve quickly. Uh, so this is the class P. So some key concepts, you have the abstract Turing machine. Uh, you have the Church Turing thesis that states that everything that can be computed can be computed by a Turing machine. So this is a way to ground computability in math and make sort of computer science uh, legit mathematical discipline in some ways. So there's many other models of computation, random access machines, probabilistic Turing machines, cellular term automaton. Uh, I mean, there's so many systems that could be, that are Turing, can simulate Turing machines. But the interesting is uh, that it's widely believed this extended church Turing thesis that nothing can be super polynomially faster uh, than a Turing machine. So this is probably a little bit false. Maybe there will be some quantum computers and stuff that can at least solve some things faster than a traditional classic Turing machine. But this is at least widely ex accepted kind of conjectures. Uh, and some really smart people have worked out this um, intricate classes of uh, complexity classes. The most important one uh, is P. So these are the problems that are solvable uh, where the input size is bounded by a polynomial, polynomial function. And these are the ones then that are 
are not. And then when it, when, when we call something intractable, it's uh, uh, it grows like this. P equals NP, that would be great, but it's widely believed that it's not. Uh, and there's some, uh, this is one of the, the biggest open problems in uh, computa computational complexity. So there's all this natural current problems that if you if you do a traveling, if you want to visit all the uh, 24,978 towns in Sweden, it takes you 85 CPU years on a single Intel Xeon, uh, yeah, like this computer. And uh, there's a notion of, uh, I don't know how technical I should be on this, but there's a notion of NP hardness, which is something that is uh, at least as hard as the hardest problem in NP. And then you have the NP complete, which is uh, NP hard, but in uh, NP. There's a great book I just read that someone who figures out uh, makes this kind of uh, take on evolution. What is thought? And has this idea that evolution is about finding, exploiting uh, the meaningful things in uh, nature so that humans can solve, uh, so our brains can solve things faster. Just given this uh, belief that P is not equal to NP. So in short, if you can show that a problem is NP hard, it means that we can find a tractable, efficient solution to it. Therefore, if ethical problems solved by a, com by a computer is uh, NP hard or harder, uh, I mean, it doesn't make sense to say harder, but because it's just a lower bound that it's at least as hard as the hardest problems in NP. We can't expect AI systems to solve them efficiently unless we add some additional resources. I mean, there's a lot of caveats to this, but it's, it's a very great general kind of statement. Uh, and it's also widely believed that human cognition is constrained by tractability. Maybe we do not really know how and to what extent, but there's a, in a lot of computational cognitive science, we assume that humans cannot solve uh, NP hard problems. Uh, we we, we have not, don't really have an example of, of a human solving this kind of problems in uh, uh, NP complete NP hard problems. But what is the complexity of ethics then? Because ethics can mean so many different things. Uh, and I've been using Mars three level analysis to be more precise about this. So Mar, he differentiated between what is the problem or goal? We can call this the computational level. Then we have what strategy or algorithm or heuristic is used. This would be the algorithmic level. And then how is it physically realized? Is it uh, the neurons of the brain or it, is it the uh, computations of, uh, of a circuit? So the, the good thing about this way of looking at it is that you make certain, uh, you might think that some system can solve this problem, uh, but then you might, you might not, you might be agnostic about the algorithm it use or the, how it's physically realized, but you have to assume that there must be such a procedure on uh, down the hi hierarchy, so to speak. So if we think that, well, this problem is uh, undecidable or intractable, then it would be weird to think that this is the way that, uh, that, uh, that, well, let's say that we have a problem and then there is no algorithm can do this, then, well, probably that's not the problem that the cognitive system tries to, to solve. But ethics would blur also the lines between these levels. And I've been working on three different uh, interpretations. Well, uh, what do we mean? Do the right thing, when, all the time, one time, where, whom? There's a certain generality ambition with the uh, ethics that you want general answers to general questions, uh, general strategy applied to apply in some situations. And this is whole, I mean, uh, debate on what ethics is, of course. But I've been working with three interpretations. Uh, and one, the first is that we see normative theory. So this would be a theory that gives you what is right or wrong, given some, some criteria of what is right and wrong. We can see this as an algorithmic solution to generalized morality. So for the, the computational problem would be, do what is moral in your general behavior. The algorithm would be, apply the normative theory generally in your general behavior. And then the mind or machine will, uh, will uh, implement this. The second would be a more narrow uh, uh, interpretation that a normative theory or different normative theories are different algorithmic solutions to specific moral problems. And here the computation would be a specific moral problem. And then the algorithm would be applying this normative uh, theory. 
But I think the best one is this. So that uh, this is the most, uh, the simplest yet essential aspect of ethical computation. And this is that you look at uh, a specific moral problem P posed by a specific normative theory. Uh, so the computational problem would be the problem as framed by the very normative theory itself. And uh, the algorithm will be whatever computational methods you use for this. I mean, this is, might sound a bit, uh, uh, there, there's like uh, 10 pages in the, in, the, in the draft if you, because this is pretty tricky to, to understand this, but anyway, uh, the idea is that if we study this, we can analyze computational methods as opposed to normative theories as algorithms. And it's also that if we think of the other interpretations, they presuppose that we can solve this too. So this is what I mean, that it's the simplest essential aspect of ethical computation. And the algorithmic level, then we can look at all the different uh, computational methods that you can apply to uh, different problems. Uh, and I roughly divide this into consequentialism, deontology, and virtue ethics. And one assumption is that ethical problems can be cast as well-defined computational problems with clear input-output conditions represented in conventional data types. I mean, this might be a bit weird, but I think at least it's a reasonable lower bound on the information theoretic nature of ethical problems in real world environments. So ethical problems, given that they are decidable at all, are at least as rich in information as their simplified counterpart. And I think this is, is a reasonable uh, uh, assumption. So consequentialism. So there's many different versions of it, but what they all share is that outcomes are at the center of moral evaluation. And I mean, if we look more broadly, all organisms care about the consequences of their actions. So causal cognition is critical for survival, harm, avoidance, planning for all creatures. And in humans, we have observed that even eight month old children can make inferences based on cause and effect. Uh, and in machines, well, they, uh, their causal engines were not refined by three and a half billion years of evolution. So we instead use Bayesian, Markovian, and Monte Carlo methods to, to do this. Here's just an example of some in the literature of this uh, suggested consequentialist robots and how they would work. I will briefly go into three aspects of a consequentialist computing. Uh, the first one is the combinatorics of uh, action outcomes. So we can think of that. Let's say we have a, this simple graph. Uh, directed graph, and we want to find the best value. Uh, and we have access to a causal oracle. So for every action, we can get something like this. So to ensure optimality here, we would we need to make five calls, right? So just five actions, five calls. So we can, uh, this is more to exemplify that it quickly comes uh, more and more complicated. If you think of the optimal combination of two actions, uh, it's not so bad. You have what I call a triangular growth, which is half of uh, a quad quadratic. If you have the optimal combination of two actions and the order matters, uh, you have a quadratic growth. Then you, if you have any number of actions, but order does not matter, we have this salad example. And then you have a exponential growth. And this is when it becomes uh, pretty bad uh, if you want to do it fast. You can think of the optimal combination of any number of actions where the order matters and you would have a factorial growth, which would be even more uh, worrisome in some cases. But it, this is more to illustrate that there's this well known uh, in planning or in the subset sum or knapsack problems that you can easily see just given the nature of combinatorics of actions you could do in a plan that you would need, uh, you would read, uh, have uh, NP completeness or in planning often. So in the scripts or propositional, propositional planning, you would have p-space complete uh, problems. So, and even here we even also assume access to some causal oracle, which we don't really have in reality. So instead we might use Bayesian uh, way of thinking about this. So this, you maybe know this man, this is uh, Thomas Bayes to the left and Judea Pearl to the right. So Judea extended this idea that you can um, you know, the probability of A given B, and then you can figure this out by this equation. 
and but you can you can generalize this to a whole Bayesian network uh, and you can do really cool stuff with this in diagnostic systems weather uh, prediction and so forth uh, this man has done a lot with it and uh, you can ask this uh, you can do a lot of interesting uh, causal reasoning with this you can figure out what is the probability so here is a do you see my mouse yeah so you have you have here's something like a trolley problem but in uh, as a, represented as a bayesian graph so you can ask what is the probability that p is true or that uh, what's the probability that this one is true x7 given full partial or no evidence about its parent variables you would have uh, what's the probability that it's true given evidence that it's a public holiday uh, you can do causal reasoning what effect does pulling the lever uh, this one have on x or uh, x7 or x8 and uh, the more difficult this one what's the most probable configuration of a set of variables given full evidence about the complement of that set or the even harder partial evidence about the complement set so these are all known hard problems exact inference is np hard most mpe is np hard more, uh, partial map is np with access to a probabilistic uh, oracle and approximations of these problems are all uh, np hard too so it's not just that in many cases you can have approximate algorithms we can get uh, pretty close to the optimal but not with uh, bayesian inference so you can do many things. You can constrain the graph, the, the, the tree width, you can ex exclude stuff. But then, I mean, you would never have a guarantee that you, you would, your constraining condition would capture reality, right? But it gets much, much worse. You would have dynamic continuous environments, uh, much more limited time to execute actions and possibly infinite amount of uh, actions. You have this butterfly effects. So how do you do then? Well, you throw dice or forget about the past. So this would be uh, Monte Carlo or Markov uh, ways you can do. And you can combine this in reinforcement learning, for instance. Some respect to the Bellman equation too in dynamic programming. But uh, in reinforcement learning, you can, uh, this is where we have seen a huge success of AI in uh, various forms of gameplay. Uh, you can deal with uncertainty in partial observability, dynamic environments. And if we can accept that the agent learns online by trial and error, uh, where, I mean, we have a state space where only exploration is the only option, right? If we can accept this, then we can do really cool stuff with reinforcement learning. But it is also uh, a lot of different uh, result, hardness results surrounding this, depending on the time horizon, or if you have a partially observable market decision process or just the normal market decision problems. Uh, I think my favorite problem, this is the restless bandit bed problem, which is uh, one of the hardest multi-armed bandit problems. It's, it's something like this that, let's say you have N children and you have M personnel and you want to minimize mischief so that, but you see that only one personnel can observe one child at a time. And if you don't observe them, uh, you will lose information and they might be up to mischief. So this is a, a version of the, P space hard uh, restless bandit problem. Uh, but of course, these results are distorted by sample complexity because if you have a, if you have a very limited environment or good task representation or a good sort of function and you can throw one year of supercompute on it, then it seems to, to work. Uh, maybe the biggest drawback is that it's not this trial and error is not afforded by real world in my environments. This is why you usually go want to minimize regret as opposed to maximize the sort of moral uh, optimal. But I think the moral of the story is that if morality was something like this, then we could have really good uh, good results. But typically, we don't. There's no. Uh, it's not clear that we have a goal with morality. The ontology you might think is a much better alternative because it's based on roots. X is right because it follows moral rule uh, Y or satisfies or this sort of thing. You can think of this uh, as if X do Y. Uh, there's a technical aspect why you might think that this is much simpler. Do you, do you see? I don't think you see this. Um, Lindner, who I met in Ulm, 
they had this uh, linear time way of checking whether an action plan is permissible in uh, really far, uh, but this is a process that you can you just iterate through a list of actions so you can eat immediately tell it whether they're good or bad there's a more psychological aspect i mean we have this fast way of doing things fast automatic we have also this slower deliberate system this is popularized by the kahneman thinking fast and slow there's an also a an, uh, more philosophical aspect to why deontology would be simpler. And uh, it's that, well, you follow traffic rules because you think that this would produce the best outcomes. But in every situation, it's not that you would compute the consequences of not following a traffic light. It's that you find that you stabilize in your belief that it's just better for me to follow this rule as opposed to just calculating for all the consequences uh, in this yeah, well, the ontology is more efficient given perfect knowledge. We would know that every intrinsically good action in uh, in every uh, situation, uh, given that we know that this, and the combinations of this would never be intrinsically bad. I mean, this is absurd. We could think of a toaster. Uh, I mean, this is maybe the, the best kind of moral system you could get from, from this way of thinking of it. A toaster that never produces uh, bad, bad bread. Um, I might skip this a little bit, but the point is that uh, uh, law, we might think of the ontology as law, but this is based on a very complex apparatus where we have courts, we have police, we have, uh, we have sort of mind, uh, social wisdom and put them into, uh, into laws. Uh, so there's this legacy of Asimov that you could program uh, laws into robots and that this would be a good idea and some people have this, discussed this divine command so divine command is that you don't you just give just like God gave uh, the ten commandments to humans to Moses on Mount Sinai you would have the idea that humans would give the divine command to, to robots and uh, this is just some examples but usually we want something more than just simply obeying rules and uh, what rules, uh, who decides the rules. And there must be a lot of different uh, conceptions of what uh, this would be the right rules. I think the more tricky thing that we actually want is how can we ensure that a rule adheres to the principle upon it was justified so that it's, it's applied in a way that justifies its use. Uh, we also want it to be interpreted in a way that allows for general application. And these two things becomes really hard. So for the first, we might think of the complexity of the golden rule. So this is common in many religions. Uh, treat others as you would like others to treat you. And we can think of this in different ways. Uh, we can think of if we refer to individual actions and individual preferences, it would be pretty easy. Action one causes pain. I do not like pain. I should not perform uh, action one. If we think of the preferences of others, it's not so much the time complexity, but more the knowledge requirements that you would need all the preferences of others and that you, this could be sort of represented in some way. But it's not uh, infeasible uh, uh, as, uh, I mean, it's pretty infeasible, but not so extreme as the ones we actually want. But this is the one we actually want when, in the complexity of the golden rule. Uh, so we want to apply the golden rule in your general behavior in a way that you would like others to apply the golden rule in their general behavior. So there's some really good examples of this. I think Kant has one. So the judge should not send the criminal to prison because the judge does not want to go to prison. This is really weird because usually we take it to mean that we are, what we do stands the trial uh, as uh, for the, the affected community or that it should be a principle that, that can be uh, justified in light of all the other members of the com community that they would reasonably accept it. But this is really complex. And one way of looking at this is to look how complicated it is to figure out good Nash equilibria. So you know that John Nash, he figured out that there exists the Nash equilibrium for non-cooperative games for two or more players. So this is based on the Brower's fixed point theorem. Uh, I think the, the simple example I often use is that if you have a map and you have a point, uh, if you have a map of the space you're in, there is a point where you are on the map. Uh, so this makes it, um, uh, yeah. And you can think of this as, so a Nash equilibrium would be that no one would uh, be better off by changing their strategy. 
So a really good idea is that something that's good for self-interest yet good for others would be something that has a good price of anarchy, which you would uh, divide the maximum maximum welfare in the centralized configuration with uh, something that's in the worst possible equilibrium configuration. Uh, but finding a Nash equilibrium is PPAD complete. It's a very special complexity class, uh, but it's it, it's because it is this that it's not technically a decision problem because it's always yes that there would be such a point, but it's more that knowing that there exists a point does not necessarily mean that it's easy to find. Uh, but the more interesting thing is that finding uh, Nash equilibriums with special properties, such as that it maximizes the optimal payoffs for all, that is NP-hard to even uh, approximate. There's a simpler way you can think of correlated equilibria from Aumann. Uh, they are much easier in some situations to, 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 to find, at least arbitrarily but it, they remain uh, NP hard to compute uh, in this kind of, if we want to maximize welfare thing. I think, so we can think that in, if everyone was really nice or everyone was really bad, bad uh, really, really bad, uh, it, it would be pretty easy to, do, to know what to do. But uh, in reality, we, it's a pretty open-ended game. There's mixed strategies, zero, non-zero sum, cooperative, non-cooperative aspects, Bayesian, imperfect, incomplete information, this sort of stuff. There's also this uh, recursive loops that uh, I believe that you believe that I believe that I have a section of this in the paper too. And I think for us humans, we draw on some kind of common knowledge probability distribution of cooperators and defectors in our local milieu. And we would use other sort of heuristics like trust, empathy, uh, intentional stance. But I mean, it is really hard to tell if a stranger, I mean, I think we all have this experience when we meet the strangers, like, should I help the stranger or should I not? We're all really sus suspicious to be exploiter or not. And I mean, even if you could have a, I mean, a super intelligent AI do this, you would, it would need a centralized solution uh, to work. Uh, so we could think of a, like an all powerful Leviathan that could uh, model every behavior mathematically. And I mean, but still, it, this society would only flourish if others followed the strategy profiles as fixated by the Le Leviathan's equilibrium computations. And I mean, you could try to convince this uh, to others, um, or you could just uh, enforce it. You might think that logic is easy to compute. So this will be another uh, legacy of the ontology, but it is not. Uh, I mean, the classic sort of undecidability of the satisfiability of uh, first order logic or uh, the piece based completeness you would find in modal logics or uh, in uh, temporal or dynamic logic. You might think that, wow, language allows me to be expressive and succinct, but in descriptive complexity, you can find that there's a trade off between expressibility and checking efficiency. So you would have all this that weaker, less expressive logics uh, would correspond to the logical structures uh, as logical structures would co correspond to these complexity classes. And this would be the ones that would allow for a richer vocabulary, uh, but they are usually uh, uh, intractable to check. So it's something like um, for all blah, 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 and uh, in this room, and for all blah, blah, blah properties, you might end up in this uh, second existential logic, uh, logic queries, and this would be uh, really tricky. And uh, another one is that interpretation is also tricky. Uh, you have this deeper problem in uh, semantics. So in, in programming, we, we might think that, well, the meaning of uh, something is that it compiles, uh, but there's really deep discussions and disagreements of what's the meaning of logical, uh, of moral terms. Uh, in metaethics, you have entire sort of fields of people have talked about this for decades of how, what is, uh, what's the meaning of moral terms? Do they express uh, a truth? Do they express uh, a sentiment or an emotion? Uh, this sort of stuff. You have some other more kind of classic results, Rice theorem, which is can be viewed as a generalization of the halting problems that non-trivial semantic properties are undecidable. You have also this liar paradox, which is really known in theories of meaning. So I think that this is that usually you can have this, this sentence is a lie. Uh, and then you, you, you realize that, well, 
is it if it's true it's a lie if it's false it's yeah you, you get into these contradictions and you can argue that there can be no unified explanation of meaning for any language uh, there's a symbol grounding like Searle, you can use this kind of the meaning would apply some strong AI that you're conscious or sentient about your, your it's grounded in some more deeper sensory motor capacities. And uh, I mean, instead of just, uh, I think this is a bit opaque, but you can think of it as pragma I'm a pragmatists when it comes to logic. I think that meaning is used. You can never have a perfect or complete meaning of meaning, but you can have, you still want something that works, right? Uh, and then if you work out this, I tried in this paper to do it with uh, Lewis and Brandon, who would be this neo Gricians or Wittgensteinians. So, and I would think that any solution is either optimistic that you would rely on cooperative principles of communication, or it's too human that you would have some inferential me mechanisms that are close to sapient mechanisms, or it's too complex because of game theoretic concerns. But yeah. The ontology is not computationally simpler than consequentialism if the rules are to be generally justified and generally applied. Uh, it might be simpler at runtime if they successfully compress moral wisdom, learning, or reasoning, but this only pushes the complexity to, to the training time and sample data. I have some other challenges for this you can read in section 5.3. And then, of course, you have the complexity of uh, moral machine learning. I worked on this. I proposed that you could make virtuous robots based on uh, uh, virtue ethics. Uh, just bring in some of my other work in here. In here, you could also think that some something like uh, a large uh, language model like GPT could have something. Uh, so this is just a saw on Twitter that on 464 moral scenarios from past papers. Uh, the GPT correlated with 95% with, with human ratings on these moral judgments. So I'll tell you a bit about uh, learning them. So uh, just to make it clear, so virtue ethics would be the idea that it's not so much about that you should do the right thing based on some rule or the right thing based on the consequences of reaction. It's rather that you should focus on your character. You can learn to be better. So this is what, what motivates this connection with machine learning. So you would have sampling complexity, which would be the number of training samples needed to learn a target function. Training time, you can separate this from training time complexity. So this would be the resources needed to train the model and the runtime complexity, which would be uh, the runtime uh, uh, run time, time needed to solve the problem. This often breaks down if we consider uh, in many settings, but uh, we can think of it as weak sample complexity or strong sample complexity. So how many samples we need to learn a target function for some specific output, input-output distribution. This is the weak, weak instance. And then the stronger one is for any possible distribution. So unfortunately, there's all these no free lunch theorems that you can find in optimization and various supervised learning and all forms of machine learning. And this is simply that, well, you can be really unlucky and then you, you're in a world with just white swans. So you will never find that black swans uh, really exist. And this is known also by Hume that we only have inductive reasons to explain why induction works well. So it's a circular uh, optimism that we, we do. And this means in, in the machine learning that, uh, so no learning algorithm can perform well on every learning task having trained upon a data set of a fixed size. So for every learning algorithm, there exists the task on which it fails as no learning algorithm can generalize to all possible realities while having only observed some instances of these realities. But surely we can learn some stuff pretty well. And we can do so by making assumptions about the sample space, like taking a parametric approach or constrain the space of hypothesis. But we know that both entail some form of inductive bias. Uh, so, I mean, this is a pretty good assumption, I think. Uh, the central limit theorem that reality tends towards a normal distribution. So if we sample a lot of stuff, we will get uh, something like this. <laughs> maybe a reality is like this, but uh, and I think we are, maybe we are right to, to do this. The other one, which is also uh, some really smart people have worked on for many decades is something called pack learnability. So 
this has complexity considerations too. So if a function is learnable, it means that there exists a learning algorithm that with a re reasonable likelihood can get reasonable generalization errors if it trains on randomly selected data, all while the number of samples are upper bounded by a polynomial function. And you can marry this with the, the VC, the vapnik chervonek uh, concept. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting concept. I, I, I don't have time to explain this, but if a set of hypotheses is packed learnable, its VC dimensions are finite. Okay, so something about VC dimensions. So it's the amount of, uh, yeah, well, I, 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 there's more things I wouldn't say. Let, let's just skip it. We can, if you're interested, I, will, I can tell it afterwards. So that it's great that with the pack is that you can define this great rich class of instances where induction is guaranteed to work, probably approximately. The drawbacks is that just knowing there exists a hypothesis H in uh, the space of hypothesis that is consistent with data does not necessarily mean that it is easy to find. So you might need vast computations to actually find a good hypothesis. And there's also some uh, many uh, hardness results from different settings of uh, the packed learning frame framework. Well, so why a lot of uh, runtime efficiency can be achieved through learning, you will never have a perfect model. So there's no globally justified inductive bias, but maybe we can have local and model dependent ones that, that works in particular instances, given what we know of, let's say the, the, the data. There's this paradox of deep learning. So the problem is not that learning is hard, but rather that we lack rigorous explanation for why some learning systems seem to generalize well in practice. So this is a limit of this computational complexity way that although we can have this uh, pack frameworks and stuff, uh, if we think in the modern time, you would have massive clusters of supercomputers doing all sorts of uh, uh, computing, a lot, a lot of problems and you have, um, this would define this kind of, uh, define the limits of this kind of analysis. But one thing is that the success of learning systems are inversely proportional to the inductive assumptions it, it exploits. So, and we might not be completely aware of this. So this is where part of this black box problem of uh, sufficiently large deep neural networks. So in summary, ethics is pretty hard. Planning is hard. Causal reasoning is hard. Sequential decision-making is hard. Strategic dynamics is hard. Logic is hard to do. Logic is hard to express. Learning is hard. Sometimes it seems to work, but we don't know why. Uh, and in the real world, I think the obvious here is like, well, what's this to do with real world? It's not like you would make this complicated calculations like this. You would have a fully integrated, so like 20 different subsystems that are uh, using different kinds of sensors and learning. I think like the, the test, some of the Tesla models are updated every week on new things uh, that you would have. It's also, I think you have something like a GPT with 175 plus billion parameters and uh, 500 billion plus tokens of data. It's, it's more that you, you, you might have this correlation uh, uh, with good human judgment, but you would have this intractable pockets of evil uh, in different dimensions of, of the data, how you would use it. Uh, but there's, I think, overall this awkward space between what you can do with uh, algorithms and what you can do with uh, machine learning. Uh, I think it points that there's this great variance and uh, dependency on the kind of resources you would have. So for the, for the classic sort of computational setting, it's time space and the knowledge you would have, the certainty, the heuristics and the, the learning you can do. For humans, we could even have this kind of internalized guilt and shame mechanisms for self-correcting our, our behavior. But I think that these three, I've explored them a bit separately, but they I think they clearly map on different aspects of our ethical lives. And they're consistent with this more dual, uh, dualistic, dualistic aspects of our sort of learned, um, and then run, uh, we can learn over a long time, and then we can have uh, instincts, automatic sort of reflective, uh, beha uh, reflexive behavior. And then you can have more, spend a lot of energy on your prefrontal areas to think really carefully of what to do. And then you can do this to suppress uh, your other sort of more automatic reasonings. There's something like a moral tractability thesis uh, here that, uh, 
Iris van Roy and others have worked out. I think it's convincing that it will show that if we think of all the Turing computable uh, functions, there must be some subset of this where you have the possible cognitive functions. Uh, I will I will return to this later. So in the end, what can computational complex complexity do for ethics? So perfect moral machines are impossible. I'm sorry, Christian. Instead, we can get the best possible given available resources in some bounded rationality. So this would be informative for the feasibility debate on uh, moral machines. Pinpoints the moral resource that, that supports tractable ethical decisions. So cognition, knowledge, learning, heuristics, trust, empathy, guilt. I mean, there's a huge variety of what you can do and depending on the, on the problem, but this could uh, help us to look into it. You can pinpoint the constraints that enables tractable ethical decisions. So in action space, the tree width, the task representation, the inductive biases that you would have, but you would have to morally justify each of this if you want to have something that is sort of consistent with uh, moral theory, right? And I think more importantly, you can pinpoint this uncomfortable trade-off between ideal and feasible and the cost-benefit trade-offs between different normative theories. And I think that you can have, uh, it can be then be informative for understanding human morality too, because we can then maybe carve out the space of what ethical agents can and can be reasonably expected to do uh, given the resources they have. So this is the moral tractability thesis that I also present in the paper. So I think that the action guidance of normative theory should be feasible with, with respect to agents resources. Uh, this could help you to find out whether something was a failure of your cognition or if you just were morally bad. Uh, it's an e experimental paradigm that you can investigate the role of cognitive resources in moral contexts. And I think that if you look here, maybe there's a hope that you can have the optimal with regards to re the resources of the ac acting uh, agent. So this is the a scale of the moral value and this is the scale of the sort of complexity. And so the interesting thing would be the bounded moral optimal. Yes, uh, thank you. This was all. Thank you very much, uh, Jakob. Uh, let's give Jakob a, a round of applause for this. And uh, I open the floor for questions or comments. Anyone? Maybe I can go first. Um, so it is often claimed that there are decisions of a moral character that we should not hand over to the machines. But I take it from your talk that uh, your talk doesn't really lend support for this. One could say that some things are too uh, computationally intractable. But then they would probably be intractable for humans as well, because there's probably no magic going on in our brains. Or how, how do you think about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a really good uh, question. I think it, it often comes up in this responsibility gap or accountability gap, or when you have something like a lethal autonomous weapon system. Mm -hmm. And then we, we don't like the idea that, well, there must be some human empathy behind the killing in some in some odd way or that someone that can has the capacity to, to feel for another uh, for another being well also in medicine it's often said that the crucial medical decisions should only be made by humans right yeah i think that um yeah it's a, it's a complex it's a complex question i i'm inclined to think that um well you want to have the best you want to do the the best thing right and if you're committed to that, then I think you're committed to uh, computational tools, computational modelings, and uh, maybe there's some things that you cannot, because uh, I have another project about optipolitics, that maybe you can optimize politics, but then you have obviously sort of quantity driven fields like money, like everyone wants money, all nations wants to optimize to maximize their GDP. But you don't want to apply that in something like uh, social policy about marriage or uh, intimate things. Like, what's the value of friendship? What's the value of love? So I think that th these were maybe the areas where you cannot 
uh, have this. Let's, let, let's say that we define a realm of qualitative values. Um, that you don't that, want to put the price tag on because that would kind of destroy the, the thing you're trying to achieve, something like that? Yeah, 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 something like that. I, I wouldn't be uh, uh, re resisting that too much. Because mm -hmm. I think I think we should we should be really careful about quantifying uh, anything uh, like this. Okay, thank you. Any further comments or questions? Was everything so clear? That's wonderful. We have a question from Pat. Yeah, thank you for an interesting uh, uh, run through of a, a, a lot of thinking and a, a lot of interesting um, um, ways of describing these challenges. I, I was wondering, is it possible to, to pinpoint who would be the main, uh, who would benefit the most or who which players would be more interested in, in the outcome of of um, what you're doing. Uh, so, uh, what um, so An stakeholders end user, would is is it a society, a company, or who would be the the users of moral machines? Um. Yeah. Well, I mean, idealistically, I hope that it will benefit human society. Uh, this is, I, I guess, I haven't because I'm. I mean. Uh, for me, it's not so much about, well, I think that for me, it's more a reflection of what human morality is and what, what is, how should we think of human morality? And this is something sacred and complex when we usually try to keep it uh, vague and opaque and uh, talk it out using our, um, our natural language. Uh, but but we... There's not an obvious market for this. No, I think my my interests are mainly uh, theoretical or for the expansion of of knowledge as no. a, as a researcher. I don't. Um, yeah, I, I, I maybe it can uh, contribute down the line, but this is nothing that I have uh, intentionally made. Uh, no, thought about too much. Playing with the thought, if I had to choose between two cars and I knew that this is the morally good car, that would influence my decision on which car to buy. Yeah, I mean, this could be one uh, one application. But I, I don't make any commitments about what sort of morality you should ultimately pick. It's more, I, I give you the framework of how to construe them uh, computationally given a very narrow characterization of uh, normative ethical theory. Uh, but th there is this, I mean, now, as far as I know, it's hard to make any, uh, uh, all the, the car manufacturers, for instance, they want to keep the human uh, accountable and responsible for all the things just because of uh, obvious reasons, because then they, it's not, uh, they would not be in legal problems. And I'm, I, I think that this will probably be the case for a very, very long time. And I, and I read some, some worrying stuff about that you should not drive with a helmet if you're riding a motorcycle, just because that would increase, I mean, then a car that's like an autonomous car will never hit you because it just greatly increases your chances of, of dying. So. <laughs> I mean, that's, and there's countless of other examples like this. Uh, where I mean, you, as a motorcycle driver, you're protected by the visual impact for the car driver that you're not wearing a helmet. Is that the mechanism? Or is it that you, by not wearing a helmet, you become yourself more careful? Uh, no, it's that the, so if you train, um, Autonomous vehicles re reduce the number of casualties. Then it should oh, never. Uh, okay. Okay. So then, if if you would hit someone with a helmet versus hitting someone with without a helmet. Oh, I see. But I mean, That's... but I mean, surely, surely the bi bicycle uh, person, surely they they have other reasons mm -hmm. to wear a helmet. Mm -hmm. Thanks. 
Thanks. Alfred? Thank you for a very good um, talk, dear brother. Um, do you have any reflections regarding chat GPT and how people are using it more and more to uh, guide their decisions and various uh, tasks at their jobs or whatever? Yeah, many, many thoughts. Uh, it's, it's what everyone is talking about, uh, isn't it? Uh, I have one worry. So one, one of my dystopian worries would be the de-skilling of uh, sort of human uh, intelligence or even human empathy. I think that in this attention war, you have every app wants to maximize engagement. So we make all the social media apps extremely addictive. We have the recommender systems in, in Netflix and now also ChatGPT to do all the programming for us or all the... And I think that, well, there's the obvious kind of uh, complex risk of that you would, it would lead to certain de-skilling of humans that they cannot come up with their own solutions to their own problems. They cannot uh, learn to be, let's say, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's from a de-skilling. I usually think of this analogy with probably the hunter-gatherer uh, human were much, much more complete. They have extensive knowledge about herbs and mushrooms and they could hunt they were like as athletic as or top athletes so the, they, their brain must be much i mean it's much more kind of general intelligence and for thousands of years we've specialized into these pockets of nerds and then uh, this is then further amplified by this uh, this lazy, lazy use of technology and i mean this would probably affect our uh, I think uh, human relationships as well. So instead of, let's say that someone you love has passed away uh, or like someone, a friend of yours, uh, mother or something has passed away. And then instead of being there and being this sort of open with, uh, I don't know, like, human experience and uh, you, you will google like what should i tell how should i treat a friend uh, you ask chat GPT, how should i treat my friend uh, who has who's mourning i mean this would be my more conservative uh, worrying perspective then of course i i think that there's there's an opposite case to be made for the, the promises that that you can do like what if you have a moral advisor that would uh, foster or like promote all your uh, your creativity and um, challenge you to learn more and challenge you to be a better person. Nice. I think we have to uh, wrap up. Thank you, Jakob, for a very informative talk. Thank you, everyone, for joining and for stimulating discussion. Uh, stay tuned to the Chair AI Ethics Seminar for further discussions including, I'm sure, this uh, GPT stuff that we touched on at the end here. So, thank you.